So welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. We're very happy today to have Anton Alexeyev. He's in Geneva and they just moved in the mathematics department a couple of months ago into a beautiful new building, which he was telling us about. And we're looking forward very much to his beautiful mathematics story because Anton has uh, both very interesting activity in mathematics and also has been very good at building a tremendous mathematical physics group in Geneva and will tell us today about conjugation of words, self interactions of planar curves and non commutative divergence. So Anton, please share your screen. Um, okay, Th thanks a lot for the introduction and thanks a lot for the uh, invitation to speak here. Uh, so let me try to share screen. Um, uh, right. So I think now, now you probably see my, the, the first page uh, or, or first slide of my talk. Uh, you know, when I got an invitation for, from Arso to speak in, in this seminar, I uh, was really hesitant. What is the story which roughly matches the seminar's uh, topic uh, I can present? And in the end, I don't know whether it's an ideal solution, but uh, on the one hand, uh, I so I had some story and I tried to make combinatorics of that story appear more prominently on the one hand. And on the other hand, well, I don't know about picture language, but there will be some pictures in the talk. So let me have it as a justification for the, uh, for the topic. And uh, so my presentation today is based on several joint works with Naria Kawazumi, Yusuki Kuno, and Florian Neff. Um, so, um, so my first real slide uh, is also a kind of advertisement of the story. As I say, uh, so I'll be uh, emphasizing some kind of combinatorial picture, but, but actually that's a big story which has many facets. Uh, and we will be covering only some small number of those facets, but maybe in the beginning, it's interesting to see what, what the whole, or at least the, the major part of the story is about. And it turns out that there is a link between many mathematical fields. Here, I tried to list some of them, to the topology, non-commutative geometry, list theory, geometry, 3D topology, number theory, and actually it's not a complete list. And in, in some way, uh, in, all those, uh, in all those fields, there are problems which are intimately related to each other. So uh, each of those problems in some way has an easy side and a hard side. Uh, maybe for the first time, it was really seen very clearly in Lee's theory. Uh, so there, there is a so-called kashivara Vern problem and we'll see it perhaps a glimpse of it towards the end of the talk, if time permits. Uh, and in, uh, in that story, there is a pair of equations one equation is a so-called so easy equation. It's related to the Campbell-Hausdorff series here. You see on the easy side log exponential of x, exponential y. And on the difficult side, it has the uh, square root of the Jacobian of the exponential map. So, um, and, and then maybe I would like to emphasize that uh, in 2D topology, basically today we'll be mostly concerned with uh, those parts on non-commutative geometry, which is very much linked to Lee's theory. That's more or less just another name that I'm using for Lee's theory here. And this 2D topology story. Uh, surprisingly, in the 2D topology story, you can make it very visual. You see here on the easy side, I'm trying to draw an intersection of two planar curves. So there is a black curve and the red curve and they intersect at those blue at, the, at that blue point, and then on the hard side you study self intersections of curves, and and there the picture you can see here is the self intersection 
of a curve with itself and the blue point now is that self intersection point. So, um, so, and then there are other, other sides to the story in geometry, these are Poisson structures and so-called battalion Wilkowski structures. In 3D topology, this is not theory and the theory of dreams with associators. And well, in a number theory, well, maybe there is nothing easy about number theory or probably we just don't quite know how to say it. There, there is uh, this hard part is this theory of multiple zeta values and the easy part, mm, I don't know what to say there. So, so you see, I, uh, I don't know how successful I am, but the idea of this slide is uh, maybe on the one hand to impress you a little bit with the scale of the picture. And on the other hand, right, we'll now dive into some combinatorics, into some sometimes relatively technical things. Uh, but, but I think uh, maybe a good point to, to take home from the talk is that there are many stories, they are related to each other. Sometimes those relations are conjectural. Some, on some occasions, they are well established. Uh, and we'll, we'll just see some small part of it today, but hopefully an interesting part. You're going to connect uh, all these subjects? Sorry? You connect all these different subjects? Oh, in principle, all these different subjects are connected. Sometimes the connections are even isomorphisms. Sometimes they're known only in one direction. Right, so, uh, but, but that's the, the full story would probably also include some more lines, like for D topology is there and maybe more, may, maybe some more lines. But, but yes, they are all uh, in fact very closely connected in, uh, in very concrete sense. Uh, and as I say, easy and hard here, these are not just concepts, but basically these are equations. Uh, and we'll see. Let's let us let us let's dive into it and let's see some some examples of how it works. Um, all right. So the uh, non-commutative geometry part of the story that I will be talking about today is the non-commutative geometry in a relatively simple and uh, very direct sense. May, maybe I refer to it as non-commutative geometry, a la Konsevich. And the idea is that uh, we try to define geometric structures on uh, free non-commutative algebras. For instance, here K is some field, usually it will be a field of characteristic zero. And we consider non-commutative polynomials with uh, generators X1, Xn. So then uh, this algebra has uh, many representations and to fix the representation, uh, we can just assign to each generator a matrix of some size and, and then uh, this, uh, the, this row, this assignment will define for us in algebra homomorphism to the nth power of uh, the matrix algebra over K of size capital N. So note that uh, here capital N can be any size, any, uh, any natural number. So from that perspective, we are thinking that we study uh, properties of matrices, which are common for all, uh, for all ranks, for all sizes. So maybe uh, to make it a little bit more concrete, let me give you some, um, some definitions. And uh, we'll start today with a very combinatorial problem of conjugation of words. So what do I mean by that? So suppose we now look at even formal power series in those non-commutative variables. And uh, so uh, uh, there are no relations between x1, x2 and x2, x1. So it's fully non-commutative. And there is a grading, uh, which is the number of letters. So the words are graded by the number of letters. Uh, in fact, for my problem, I would like to be a little bit more specific. I don't look at all the polynomials or at all the words. And instead I look at Lie words or Lie series. So those are spanned uh, by generators, whatever, Xi's, and then by uh, Lie brackets, which are now just represented by commutators. 
and then multiple commutators and multiple, multiple commutators and so on. So there is this uh, space spent by Lee words or Lee series. And one of the very prominent examples is the baker kemper hausdorff series, uh, which is a log of exponential of x1, exponential of x2. And it's a common knowledge that we can rewrite it as a series in uh, commutators and multiple commutators. It starts with x1 plus x2, and then it continues with one half of uh, uh, commutator x1, x2, and, and so on. So there are ways to, to write down that series. So one more, um, one more player in the game uh, is the exponential of this space of Lee series. I can think of it as sitting inside this uh, algebra of uh, uh, formal power series in my non-commuting variables. And examples of group elements are, for instance, here I have exponential of x1 or exponential of x1 times exponential of x2, which is simply exponential of the baker kemper hausdorff series. So that's, that's a very generic setup. Up to now, nothing happened. And uh, now here is, uh, here is one of the key definitions. Suppose we have two least series A and B, uh, and we say that they are conjugate if there is a, a group element uh, in exponential of L such that B is a conjugate of A with respect to that element G. So here in this, uh, uh, in this algebra, in, this, in those, no, those non-commutative power series, we can simply write B is G A G minus one. So again, uh, a simple example of it, if I write the uh, uh, baker kemper hausdorff series in the other order, exponential of X2, exponential of X1, then I can represent it as a conjugate of the original baker kemper hausdorff series with exponential of x2, right? So now here is a question. Suppose I'm given two such least series, uh, how to decide whether they are conjugate or not. And uh, I will now try to present you an interesting new criterion on how to decide uh, of this conjugation property. Um, for that, I need one more tool. So this tool is called cyclic words. So again, uh, I have my non-commuting uh, power series in variables x1, xn. And now I uh, divide uh, this algebra by the space of commutators. So uh, let me denote the natural projection from uh, from, from this space A to these cyclic words by trace. It is uh, of course suggestive word because now I can commute them under the, under the trace if I, decide, uh, if I divide it by commutators. Or you can of course think of it as the uh, zeros uh, Hochschild homology if, uh, if you want some more elaborate language. And here, for instance, now we take x1, x2, and x2, x1, and simply by definition, uh, the, the trace of x1, x2 is equal to x2, x1. So, so these, those cyclic words, they're um, kind of universal traces on, on that algebra. So now suppose that uh, two words are conjugate to each other. So B is G A, G minus one. Uh, then, uh, of course, if we take uh, a trace of any power of B, it will be equal to the trace of the same power of A, right? Because under the trace, as under the normal trace, so we can write it as trace G A G minus one, G A G minus one, and so on, G A g minus one. So those g's in the middle, they will cancel just, just, just uh, independently of anything. And then uh, those g's will cancel by the property, by the cyclic property of the trace. And this will be a trace of a to the power n. 
Now, uh, the key question is, is it really true in the opposite direction? Suppose that the nth powers of traces are the same. Will uh, A and B be conjugate? And actually, uh, we know this problem from our linear algebra class, right? So suppose you know such a thing for some matrices, whatever, n by n matrices. Then the answer is no, right? So that's because if you have a Jordan block, so then it has uh, all the traces of powers which are the same as the thing which doesn't have a Jordan block but has the same eigenvalues. So it actually does not work for matrices. And I told you that this story is a kind of universal story for matrices. Uh, I must say that the full answer to the question is not known as far, at least to the best of my knowledge. However, here is a theorem that uh, I proved in collaboration with Kawazumi, Kuno, and Neff. And it says that in some cases, um, uh, it works in the opposite direction, uh, which means that all the traces of powers are equal, implies that the words are conjugate. It's actually, um, no, I, I don't know why, why, it is, why it is that way. So the case is when we know that it works. First of all, suppose that uh, your word, right? We said that there is a grading and we can say that it starts with some uh, linear term and then it has a quadratic term and then it has higher order terms, right? Suppose that the linear term is non-vanishing. So that's the first case. And the second case, if the linear term is vanishing, then suppose that the quadratic term is of this very, very special form. First of all, the number of letters must be even. And then uh, it starts with this sum of uh, uh, commutators, x1 with x2 plus x3 with x4 plus so on. Of course, you can rename commutators. Uh, you can rename the generators as you want, but let's assume it is this way. So then if the traces of powers are the same, then the words are conjugate. Uh, and we actually don't know whether, whether it's true or not for, for other cases, right? Of course, one can imagine some other quadratic term. One can imagine that there are simply no linear and quadratic term. It starts with a cubic term. So maybe it works or maybe it doesn't work. Uh, already the, the proof for the quadratic case that we're gonna use actually to, later today is already somewhat horrible. The, the proof for the linear case uh, is combinatorial, but it's okay. So I, I, I don't want to speak about those proofs because they are somewhat technically involved, but I think it's a very interesting fact. So, uh, so we are speaking about something like a problem, uh, an eigenvalue problem for matrices, but universally for all sizes. And surprisingly, this problem sometimes uh, sometimes work, works even better than for matrices themselves. So it's a linear algebra, but it's better than linear algebra. It has stronger, stronger results. So, uh, so this, this was the story of conjugation of words. And I plan to show you how, how it's applied to some part of the bigger story that I showed you before on the first slide. Uh, but for that, we would need to dive now uh, to the, uh, to the two-dimensional topology and actually draw some pictures. So let's, uh, let's have a look at it. So applications or um, two-dimensional topology story. So we fix K, a field of characteristic zero. And uh, we look at sigma a compact oriented to manifold it may have several boundary components. In fact, um, the story is more or less simple if it's of genus zero and has many boundary components, or if it is of any genus, but there is only one boundary component. Uh, so I will probably focus on that second case to simplify life. So we know how it works for any, for any sigma, 
but I think uh, it would require too much of uh, technicalities. And uh, there is this space, of course, you may be wondering what is two-dimensional, what kind of two-dimensional topology I want to speak about, right? There is nothing there. There is a classification of surfaces, which is fine, but uh, what, what is there besides the classification of surfaces? So um, there is this story uh, of that space that I denote G of sigma, and this is a case span of homotopy classes of closed oriented curves on the surface. So for instance, here on, on that surface, you see alpha and beta. So these are two closed oriented curves. They are based, but they don't need to be based in this uh, definition. I can draw them wherever I want. For instance, let me draw one more curve. For instance, this is gamma and it's also eligible. So in fact, this space has several interesting presentations. Let me mention two of them. So one of them is, uh, this is a case span of conjugacy classes of the, in the fundamental group, phi one of the surface. And uh, the other presentation that we actually find useful, it is the quotient of the group algebra of uh, pi one by, by the space of commutators. You know that something that we've seen before in that story of uh, conjugation of words. So we take an algebra and we divide it by the space of commutators. And I again will denote by trace the projection from the algebra to the space of commutators. For instance, uh, I, I can write trace alpha beta, and this is equal by definition to trace beta alpha. And alpha and beta may be those curves that I, I'm drawing on the surface. So now I'll show you some very, very famous construction with those curves. And it's called the golden bracket. So the golden bracket does the following. It takes two such curves or two such homotopy classes of curves and it associates to it uh, the third one. And here is the uh, very nice geometric formula for it invented by Goldman. So you take those uh, curves. And so since these are homotopy classes, you can always choose representatives such that those representatives have only a finite number of transverse intersections. So you don't allow those curves to touch to intersect infinitely many times. Uh, so you choose good representatives. For instance, here uh, on my drawing, I have alpha and beta and they, they behave well. They intersect only once. But in principle, there might be some finite number of intersections that's also fine. So we take a sum over those intersections and uh, we sum up those uh, um, those terms where epsilon p is just a sign. So what, what this sign is? So the surface is oriented and the curves are oriented. So when, we, when we're sitting at this uh, intersection point p, so there are tangent vectors to those two curves and they are ordered. So because alpha was the first one and beta was the second one. So they form a frame in the tangent space and uh, we would like to compare the orientation of that tangent frame to the orientation of the surface. So, uh, and this gives us a sign, which is a plus or minus one. And then uh, here I write this trace alpha uh, attached to beta at P. And here what happens, you see, that's a local, that's a local picture, right? The intersection of the curves, it looks like, like this. Right, so that was the point P. And then there is a unique way to resolve this intersection which preserves orientations. So here I resolved it and the intersection point is gone. So then uh, this operation always makes one curve out of two curves. So, and I denote the corresponding element by trace alpha beta. And actually, you know, here I think I, I made a mistake let me better write it, trace alpha bracket, trace beta. 
Okay, so Galton proved the following theorem. Um, so this uh, bracket is well defined because I said it's defined on homotopy classes of curves, but actually it is well defined, right? I, I define it now on representatives, but but it's it's okay. So it will be the same for any representative, and in fact it's a Lie bracket. Now I I have a question to Arthur. Arthur. Uh, are we allowed to give home assignments? As long as they're easy. What's, 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 you're, you're the boss, right? I mean, we, we kind of, I, I follow what you say. Yes, you, you, can, you can okay. do what you like, but then, okay. yes, you shouldn't discourage the audience. You should encourage them. Sure, sure. Absolutely, absolutely. But, uh, but what I want to say, so uh, especially the fact that it's well, de well defined, it's a very nice exercise. So if you want one exercise from, uh, from uh, today's lecture, might be a good idea. I, I think it's, it's a very beautiful drawings. Uh, like you draw various triangles with those curves. So you need three curves. So you, you, or you, you, you try to change one of the curves, you see what happens. So that's uh, that's a very beautiful exercise. I, really but, and Anton, I don't know this bracket. It's very interesting. Where where is was it defined? What where is the paper? Oh oh, it's uh, it's uh, okay. Maybe, maybe then I should tell a little bit of the story. So I think it's actually started with Turayev. We'll we'll come back to Turayev later in the talk. But it started with Turayev, who in the end of 70s, so it was very long ago. He started making uh, various, uh, he found many operations uh, uh, made of curves on surfaces, not necessarily closed curves, sometimes open curves. And then in the beginning of 80s, maybe something like 84, I'm, I'm now kind of, I'll send you the reference to the Goldman's paper. Goldman came, came up with this operation and it was not on the Toriev's list, so that was a new operation. And uh, it was motivated by the theory of uh, flat connections on two surfaces due to a T and bot. So, uh, so this golden bracket is an attempt of combinatorial and understand the T and bot story. And then later on, uh, Turayev came back, and he, uh, you will see, you will see on one of the next slides the Turayev theorem uh, on that. So I'll, I'll later send you the reference to Goldman's paper. Now, well, it's a Lie algebra defined by surface, as you see in purely uh, topological terms. So it's 2D topology of intersections of curves. And of course, you can ask a question, uh, what is the center of that algebra? And this was, this was settled by Ettinghoff using actually the Atiyah bot picture. So this Goldman's picture is related to some other more geometric story due to Atiyah and bot. And it turned out that this is, uh, this is the most direct way to figure out what is the center. And it turns out that the center uh, it corresponds to classes of powers of boundary loops. So if your surface has uh, boundary components, for instance, here, uh, here, this is the boundary, boundary loop, you can take powers of it and uh, take the corresponding trace and those elements was, was, would span for you the center. In fact, uh, some of those elements are actually equal to each other. For instance, if you take the zeros power, so uh, you, can, you can use the notation one for the zeros power and all zeros powers by definition are simply trivial loops. And trivial loops are in the center. And here, just, just as a small exercise that I'm solving myself, I, I want to show you that they, they're in the center. Suppose you have uh, this uh, black curve. So this is the picture down the slide. So suppose you have that black curve and you have a trivial red loop, which uh, intersects with that black curve. But of course I can always move it such that it no longer intersects. And then let me recall the Goldman's formula. In the Goldman's formula, you have a sum over intersections. But if there are no intersections, then there is no sum. 
and the result is zero. So, uh, so this, uh, this, for this trivial loop, we know it's in the center. But uh, for, the, for, the other, for the other boundary loops, you need to work a little bit, but not too much to show that they're in the center. The question is whether that's the whole center and that's the Ettinghoff's theorem. So now uh, let me dive even a little bit deeper in the topic. Uh, and let me recall that on pi one, you can introduce the uh, standard, uh, the standard series, the standard family of subgroups. We take uh, group commutators. So here the, here the group commutator by definition is alpha beta, alpha minus one, beta minus one. Uh, and then multiple double commutators, triple commutators and so on. So this induces for us a filtration on, the, uh, on this k pi one and a filtration on, uh, uh, on, this, uh, on this vector space or now on this Lie algebra that we are considering. And uh, we'll be looking at the associated graded of that Lie algebra. So here from now on, I will always assume that the surface has only one boundary component. So uh, in principle, it's not necessary, but otherwise I either need to explain too much or I need to cheat enormously. And both things are complicated, <laughs> right? So, um, so uh, it turns out that the a good way to think of the associated graded is as follows. You see, we, we were speaking about the pi one of the surface. What's the easiest thing that, than pi one? What is its close relative? It is H1, the first homology. And it turns out that the associated graded is well represented in terms of cyclic words in letters given by the first homology classes. So that's, uh, that's, the good, that's the good way to think of this um, associated graded. Maybe a little bit more concretely, so suppose we have those alpha i's and beta i's, some generators of pi one. So I tried to draw those alpha one and beta one for uh, a torus with one boundary component. And let's denote their homology classes by x's and y's. So x's are homology classes of alphas and y's are homology classes of betas. So then for instance, there would be this, um, there would be this uh, trace xi, yj. This would be one cyclic word in homology classes. But of course, it may be much longer. It may have just one letter, whatever you want. So then when we make an associated graded under some filtration, we may ask what happens with the structures that we have on our space. And in particular here, what happens with the Goldman bracket, right? So the Goldman bracket was an interesting structure on G of sigma. Now we have a filtration and we have the associated graded. What, what will be the fate of, uh, of this guy? And it turns out, so this is uh, an easy fact, but probably for you at the moment, it may look somewhat surprising. So uh, the graded version of that bracket will be again a Lie bracket, which will have a degree minus two. So in fact, that may be not that surprising, right? We know that the natural structure on uh, homology of uh, surfaces is the Poincaré appearing. And the Poincaré appearing is something like this, right? So uh, we know that alpha and beta intersect at one point, let's say positively. So this intersection pairing of xi and yj will be the Kronecker delta and x's don't intersect, y's don't intersect. So it stands to a reason that whatever it is, this graded bracket, it will be killing one x and one y. And then this will be of degree minus two, it will be killing two letters. In fact, there is a nice combinatorial picture for this graded bracket. I'm not going to show you this picture now. Of course, if you want, you can ask me after the talk. 
So that's uh, that's a simple and beautiful story. But for us, it will be uh, nice to know that it is of degree minus two. Now here is the here is the next question. Uh, I call it golden formality. Maybe some people criticize me for using the word formality, but uh, so so here is the question. Uh, whether this golden bracket, the beautiful one that I described for you uh, in the case of surfaces, is it isomorphic to its graded version? So the graded version I described to you indirectly. I said, take the associated graded, take the associated graded of the bracket. We know that its degree is minus two. I, I tell you that there is a simple description, but I didn't disclose to you this description. So the question is whether this associated graded gadget, whether it's isomorphic to the original one. And um, there is a very surprising and very interesting result. It was discovered and rediscovered by many groups. And probably the first two were Kawazumi and Kuno and in parallel Masio and Turayev. And then later on Neff gave a different interpretation to this theorem. And the theorem says the following. Suppose that theta uh, is a map from uh, the um, group algebra of uh, pi one to the Tensei algebra of, uh, of the first homology. And suppose that this is a map of core algebras. Maybe I uh, kind of, a cheating way to do it would be not to mention this condition, but let me still say it. They, they both have a natural core algebra structure and we want this theta to be a map of core algebras. But I mean, okay, for us, it's, it's not, it, it, I, I'm just saying it for completeness. And let's, uh, let's assume that we have the following normalization. So theta of a generator of pi will be equal to one plus its uh, homology class, plus perhaps some higher order terms. So then, uh, the following one condition that theta of the boundary loop. So this boundary loop, right? That's the product of commutators of uh, generators uh, is conjugate to the exponential of the sum of commutators of their homology classes. So this, this looks like a complicated equation but this is just one equation. If this equation is satisfied, then theta is a Lie algebra isomorphism. So implies golden formality. Uh, it is the same as to say theta is a Lie isomorphism. Uh, why, why do I find it surprising? Why should one find it surprising? That's because, you know, Lie isomorphism is many, many equations. So uh, a, a, an image of some element bracket with the image of some other element is the image of their Lie bracket, right? It's an infinite number of, uh, of things to check. And here, those, uh, those people, Kawazumi, Kuna, Masio, Turayev, and Nev, they are telling us that actually you need to check only one equation and even you need to check this equation only up to conjugation. So, and if it's verified, then, then you are good. So, um, okay. Uh, so that's, that's a very nice result. Now the question is, uh, does it work in the other direction? Suppose, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the other direction would be not this, sorry. Uh, maybe I, oh, right. So the other direction would be the following. Suppose that we know that theta is uh, a golden formality. Then is it true that these two elements are conjugate? Yeah, that's, um, that's the question. And we were recently able to prove it. And here is an idea of the proof. Actually, again, I, I don't quite know. 
in a talk, usually the, uh, the speaker is supposed to torture you with at least one proof, right? Is it, is it correct, Arthur? It depends on the speaker. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that, that's right. You always have <laughs> very good answers to those provocative questions. Yeah, okay, let, let me try. In fact, towards the end, I have one more proof, but we'll see, maybe we won't have time for it. But at least let me, let me show you an idea of this proof. So suppose that theta is a Goldman is a Goldman formality, which means that theta establishes an isomorphism between two Lie algebras. So then, uh, well, by Ettinghoff's theorem, we know that the center, we, we now have only one boundary loop, this one. So the center is spanned by traces of powers of that boundary loop. Now, uh, it's a relatively easy exercise to show that the center of associated graded is spent by traces of powers of the sum of commutators that I call omega. Omega, it resembles the symplectic form, that's why, or intersection pairing, whatever, whatever you prefer. Uh, also, that's a very simple calculation to check that uh, theta of, of that boundary loop, it starts with one plus omega plus higher order terms. Okay. Now theta is an isomorphism of Lie algebras. So it, uh, it sends central elements to central elements. So this is, this is kind of trivial. Now with a little bit more work, one can figure out that actually trace of the power of log of, of that loop will be exactly trace of omega to the n. For that, you need a little bit of reasoning with uh, whatever freely algebras and cyclic words, but this more or less follows from what I have uh, written before. And now you see we are exactly in the context of this conjugation of words problem. And so this implies the theta of log of gamma naught is the conjugate of omega. And then of course, theta of gamma naught is a conjugate of the exponential of omega. And this um, completes the proof. Let me try to make a sign for it. Um, okay, so, so that's, that's how that combinatorics helps us understand intersections of curves. But remember, in the beginning of the talk, I told you that intersections of curves is an easy thing. So I don't know whether you find it easy or difficult. Uh, one can actually give some technical meaning to this word, uh, to this word easy. But now let's do something uh, supposedly complicated. So, um, so Turayev here introduced many other operations with curves, and in particular, here is the operation with just one curve. It's called delta, and now we basically use the same formula as we did before. So the picture below is supposed to be a sphere with three holes. So this surface is a sphere. Well, let me try to, to color it. I don't know how successfully. So this, this surface is a sphere with three holes. And there is a curve, this red curve alpha, and it has a self-intersection. So we arrange representatives to have a finite number of transverse self-intersections with sum over those self-intersections. And epsilon is again the same sign. And now uh, if we do a resolution, then one curve will split into two curves, always. And I call them alpha prime and alpha double prime. And so I take the exterior product of them. So that's a map. In other words, so this delta is a map from G of sigma to wedge two, G of sigma. So here is a theorem by Turayev and Chas. Uh, and it says uh, that delta is well defined. And then uh, that G of sigma, the Goldman bracket, and this delta is an involutive Lie by algebra. 
Well, I mean, probably you, okay, at least the chances are, maybe you don't know what is the involuntary flea by algebra. But let me first say that uh, delta is well-defined. It's actually false. And uh, you can easily, easily figure out why. That's because if I take a curve and I make a very small loop here, right? So then delta would send this configuration to a configuration like this, right, wedge. And this is not zero, right? So it's, it's actually not homotopy invariant. However, well, there are various, various ways to solve this problem. And one way to do it, for instance, is to consider instead of G of sigma, it's quotient <clears throat> by the subspace spent by trivial loops. Trivial loops are central. So, so after that, this operation is well defined. I suggest to do the following. So there are some other ways to deal with it as well. Uh, I suggest to ignore this problem. Let's, for the next 15 or 14 minutes, let's pretend it's not there. So, of course, that's maybe not a very mathematical approach, but... So here, just to tell you uh, some things about those involative Lie-by algebras. So these are many equations which relate the bracket and delta. For instance, the involutivity property proved by Chas is the fact that if you first take delta and then you take the bracket, you take a composition that you have zero. So one of the equations is like that. So delta is a derivation of the bracket. And there are, there, there are some other conditions. I don't want to, to, to tell you, especially that late in the talk, what those conditions are. Maybe one remark, which is important, that again, you can play the grading story the, and the associated gradient of delta has degree minus two. So it's similar to what happens with a bracket. You need to kill one X and one Y somewhere. Right. And here is a question. Now a more complicated question of Goldman to arrive formality. Can you actually uh, establish an isomorphism between uh, the whole structure, G of sigma, the bracket, the core bracket, and the associated gradient. So we already know the answer, right? For, uh, for the first half of that question, right? So that was the theorem we had before. Uh, but now what about the full problem? So here, that, that's, that's an example of the situation I described to you on the first slide. There was an easy problem which only had brackets, but now the difficult problem has both brackets and co brackets. So, in fact, um, by now uh, there is quite a lot of literature about it. And uh, so, there are many methods how in, in, that people use to address this uh, Goldman derived formality. So, for genus zero, uh, Masuyo derived it from the Konsevich not invariant, so the positive. So the answer is, uh, let's say, up to technical details, the answer is always positive. Um, so in genus zero, so one way to deal with it is a Konsevich not invariant. And uh, Kawazumi, Kuhn, and Neff, and myself, we use the so-called kashivara verne problem in Lee theory. And then in a separate approach with Neff, I use the knizhnik zamologic of connection. Of course, those, those things are all in some way related. And in, a geno, in higher genus, it is significantly more complicated, and, but still there, there are two, two very different solutions. So again, the same group, we used so-called elliptic associators to solve it. And Richard Hayne, he used the Hodge theorem, a very, very different technology uh, to, to solve this Goldman derived formality problem. Um, so uh, now I want to, in the last 10 minutes, I want to show you a glimpse and how our proof works. And I think it's also interesting because it will start 
this a little bit of non-commutative differential calculus. So, uh, so basically the main thing uh, that I want, and I, well, I don't know, maybe it's too late in the talk to, to, to give some simple things, but still let me try. Uh, so, uh, um, so suppose we want to do differential calculus in those fully non-commutative variables. Well, we need to start with partial derivatives. And somewhat uh, shockingly, partial derivatives now, they map uh, our algebra into the tensor product of two copies of the algebra, instead of mapping it to the algebra itself, as we do in uh, first year calculus. So here is an example which tells you how it works. So I take x1, x2, x3, and we know there are no relations. So when we take the partial derivative d2, we have to remember where, the, where x2 was because otherwise we lose information about it. And so uh, we get x1 tensor x3. So we're using the Swedler notation here. So di prime will be standing for the operation which goes to the, uh, uh, to the first tensor factor and di double prime, it goes to the second tensor factor. So now, uh, of course, we still have normal derivations which replace vector fields, right? And I will use this notation that uh, u of xi will be denoted by ui. So it completely determines what, so th this set of uis it completely determines what uh, the derivation is because we're acting on a free algebra. Now here is an interesting definition. So we want to, something which would replace the divergence. And so we'll do this, the, the following thing. We'll apply, uh, so usually, right? Let me recall that the usual divergence of a vector field is uh, the sum of partial derivatives of its components, right? Now I'm trying to do the same. And of course the partial derivatives, now they have two components, di prime and di double prime. And it turns out that one should take cyclic word, the trace of each of those components. So, so I don't know whether you find it surprising I find it very surprising and you may ask, okay, why don't you keep the components as they are? Why do you want to take traces? What, what's the point of it? And the next slide uh, gives an answer to that worry, to that natural question. So this divergence turns out to be uh, a Lie algebra cost cycle on derivations with values in tens the product of two copies of cyclic words. So this phrase stands for the following formula. So the divergence of the Lie bracket of two derivations is the derivation applied to the divergence of the first one minus the other way around. And that's what you probably want from the divergence, right? So that's, uh, that's the classical property of the ordinary divergence that we are using in uh, ordinary differential geometry. Uh, now, if you don't put traces, then this property would not be satisfied. Moreover, I still find it rather surprising that if you do put traces, then this property is recovered. So in other words, this divergence is the right object. It was probably, again, it was discovered in many parallel developments. I think probably, probably some version of it is already in, in Kashivara Vern. And then um, somewhat different version, maybe a somewhat less powerful version uh, was considered by Konsevich. Um, but I think that's essentially, that's probably this construction is essentially due to Florian Neff when we were developing color stories. So um, now uh, let me spend the last two, three minutes uh, by giving an outline of our proof of Goldman-Turai formality. 
So maybe here I break the rules because that's already the second proof that I'm trying to sell you. But it's very short, it's just one page. And the first idea is to use the Goldman bracket to create derivations. So it turns out that you can make sense uh, of a Goldman bracket of a cyclic word and of an element of k pi one. I didn't explain to you how it works. I only explained how to define it on the cyclic words, but actually you can do it more or less with the same formula and you get a derivation. In fact, those formulas they were invented, probably you can deduce them from Turayev's works of the end of seventies. So then uh, it turns out that there is this very beautiful relation so the delta of Turayev that I showed you before, it's actually a divergence of that vector field of that derivation that I, that, that, that I just defined. And you see here, remember that I showed you the relation between delta and so delta is a derivation of the bracket. And divergence is a, a one co-cycle. So these two properties are related and that's essentially why you can invent a formula like that. I think that's probably probably the key thing in the proof. Uh, and now, well, uh, in order the brackets to go into the brackets, you want this first equation, right? Remember, that's uh, that's the story that we already looked at in detail. But then the only extra element that you need if you want the core brackets to go to core brackets is that the divergence is preserved. And so these are two equations. And it turns out that in Lee theory, those equations, they were already known and they're called kashivara vern equations for the kashivara vern problem. And we knew how to solve them. So that's, that's why we can, we could solve this problem. Um, so the, the last slide, about something which is not known, or partly it's not known, or partly it's not known. It's known. So now it turns out that this uh, this whole structure, uh, g of sigma, the bracket and co bracket, is very rigid. What does it mean? It's rigid. If you look at its derivations, so the derivations of this structure will be very small, and conjecturally. Uh, those derivations coincide with some famous uh, Lie algebra, which comes from number theory and uh, three-dimensional topology. It's called the grothendieck teichmuller lie algebra. And recently there was a huge advance in its theory when Francis Brown uh, proved half of the conjecture saying that this GRT1 is isomorphic to the free Lie algebra with generators, one generator in each odd degree. So he showed that actually this freely algebra is contained in GRT1. And uh, it is now known that also GRT1 in, is contained in the symmetry algebra, in the algebra of derivations of uh, this graded uh, goldman turayev gadget. So uh, conjecturally, all those Lie algebras are the same. And they, they, they also uh, govern the other parts of the story from the first slide. So maybe that's actually my time is up. I still have one minute and let me use one minute to uh, show you the last slide. And that's the thank you slide. So thanks a lot for your invitation. And uh, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much for a wonderful overview of a fascinating subject. So there's so many things that seem to connect to other things. Is there a cohomology theory behind all of this? Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't quite know. You see the, let's say I, uh, uh, don't know how to answer in, 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 in one word. Uh, I think, um, let's say uh, there are 
some chemologist theories, uh, relatively famous chemologists uh, in the, let's say, or I, did, I, didn't, I didn't emphasize it, but uh, all, these story, all these stories, they use Greenfield associators very much. I showed them on the first slide. And then there are, there are chemologist theories which govern the existence of Greenfield associators. As far as I know, those chemologist theories, they, they're still in some way unknown because uh, to prove the existence of drink associators, people don't know how to do it chemologically. They only know it with a drink construction which uses the Knizhny examological equation. So from that perspective, yes, there, there are, okay, may, maybe there are some other answers to the equation about chemo series. So I'm sure that there's a great deal of discussion, many questions. So if you uh, could please turn on your video so we can see who's talking, it would be wonderful so we could have real interaction. So these pictures remind me of so much of planar algebras. Is there a connection there? Yeah, I, I, I don't quite know. You see, probably for that, I would need to know. Yeah, I, of course, I heard many talks about planar algebras. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Of course, pro, pro, I, I mean, I'm, I'm almost sure that one can put it uh, in, in that framework, but I don't know of any like concrete relation, relation Question-wise, so that 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 I, I I don't quite know. Okay. Um. Are there uh, so uh, I know that uh, this zeta values um, are related uh, to. Uh, uh, to uh, multiple integrals. So how to, uh, so, so where the uh, iterated integrals coming into the story? Oh, okay, uh, so, right. Um, so so uh, let's say maybe uh, I, I don't give a full answer, but let me give a partial answer to your question. Uh, so recall that I mentioned the proof of the Goldman Turai formality using the the, the Knizhny logic of connection, right? So so uh, and recall that we need to uh, make a map from cyclic words uh, in uh, um, in the group algebra of pi one into cyclic words uh, in uh, uh, in, homo in homology generators. Right, so that's that one. One can say that's our task. Now, suppose we have just one loop, and the KZ connection you can think of it uh, as a connection with values in the freely algebra spanned by homology classes. So now you take you compute the holonomy of that connection, and the holonomy of a connection along the loop. It's a sum of uh, multiple integrals, right? Exactly integrals over simplices, exactly in the def as in the definition of uh, zeta values. So, uh, um, so, so now uh, the claim is that uh, this uh, this integral produces uh, produces an isomorphism of uh, goldman turai lie by algebras, and the map will be. Uh, uh, a sum of uh, multiple integrals and coefficients in front of multiple integrals will be products of homology classes. So, um, so that's one. Uh, so it, it sounds very technical, but you can also link it to multiple zeta values that you see in the uh, uh, Knizhny examological associator. I'm not sure if whether you're familiar. 
with uh, uh, with that object. So um, so so that the one, one can also link it there. Yeah. Thanks for the question. So it sounds like you have a gigantic program, Anton. Where are you going with this next? Well, of course, I mean, right, I, I haven't mentioned, but there are many, many people working on different parts of it. And then of course, I guess the dream would be to have one theory which, uh, which naturally explains why all these things are hopefully the same. Right. Um, I, some people say maybe that's the theory of periods. Um, yeah, I, I don't quite know, but uh, but of course, uh, developing why different facets of this theory are the same, why at least some of them are the same, or maybe they're actually different. I also heard recently some people saying that they don't believe some of the conjectures that maybe different parts of the story are in fact somewhat different. So um, it's still very much open, but, but I guess the dream would be to have uh, some kind of uh, unified theory, which would naturally say, oh, so the BV structures are, are, are here because of this, and this 3D topology is there because of that, and, and so on. So in fact, it must be, if all the conjectures are true about the isomorphisms, it must be in the end just one theory. But what it is, yeah, I think, People, people don't, don't don't know yet. So Is from it, that perspective, it, it, it's both uh, mysterious, but but also very interesting because there are many concrete questions. Does it connect to higher dimensions? Uh, yeah, sure. Because the, the, there is also four D topology. For the, there is at least one facet relating to four D topology. It's uh, due to Barnatan and Dancho, uh, they gave some kind of four-dimensional interpretation of uh, the kashivara vern problem. And we gave a two-dimensional interpretation uh, uh, up to date, it's not known how they are related. Topological interaction, we have curves and surfaces which participate. So um, yeah, I, I, it, so potentially there is also, I, I haven't heard of anything higher than four dimensions, but there is potentially four dimensional lag into the story. But uh, this uh, bracket, uh, the Goldman bracket that you defined, uh, um, that you mentioned yeah. that clearly can be defined for even uh, dimensional manifolds for the homology oh. classes. Oh, that, uh, on, that, that, uh, on that, sure. There is the whole big branch of mass, which is called string topology. It's due to Sullivan and Sullivan and Chas. So, so these are higher dimensional, higher dimensional analogs. I think uh, there people recently also have a lot of progress. I didn't look at it too closely myself, but uh, uh, string topology is, uh, is the right word for it. I think there it gets much, you, you see, I basically showed you the correct definitions uh, today, but in higher that The, uh, this uh, the kind of higher dimensional story of how you would define those self intersections and what would you do with them. I think you already, you need to, to do in some way into the families of curves. You cannot simply do it with curves. And, uh, and I think it's also technically becomes much more involved. So, so it looks like um, there should be some higher dimensional version of uh, Kantsevich integral to make a counterpart 
Is it no? Is it known how to define Kansevich integral for higher dimensional situations? Like um, again, I, I I can only give a partial answer to your question, and um, I I don't know it technically, but I heard several several times the talks uh, by uh, Florian Neff and by Thomas Wilwacher who were uh, doing something with the string topology using Feynman graphs for some kind of uh, Chern-Simons type theory. It does sound a little bit in the direction of an answer to your question, because they can say which integral, that's the Feynman integral for the, uh, uh, for the Chern-Simons theory. And they have some kind of analog, I think higher dimensional analog of Chern-Simons and some Feynman, Feynman rules for it. So yeah, I, that's, but, but that's at the level of detail that I know. One would need to look in more detail at what they're doing. Okay, thanks. So are there any other comments? <laughs> Well, if uh, not, I, oh, there is a comment. Who's talking? No, I was, I was, uh, I was talking and I was uh, j uh, just saying that I want to thank you again for the invitation and thank you for your interesting questions. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, giving this talk and uh, well, thanks again also, and thanks again, everybody. Well, thank you for a really beautiful presentation and an overview. And next week, we'll be back here again, and Jens Hoppe will give the talk. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you.